Fantastic. That should mean we're up and running here, guys. Welcome aboard. Um, for those of you uh, just joining the chat, welcome to our uh, advanced synoptic and spreadsheet session tonight. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm one of the tutors primarily based over in Cambridge. Uh, and we're picking up from week two's tasks here, as you can see on screen. Uh, we're going to run through the synoptic task first before we'll move on to a spreadsheets based task here as well. OK, so in terms of what we're running through tonight, we've got a bit of a mixed bag. We're getting a look at a few different areas here, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, we're going to ha be having a bit of a look at inventory. We're going to be having a look at some non-current assets as well. So making sure we're happy with the treatment of both of those things uh, when it comes to um, sort of the synoptic side of things, as well as a bit of bookkeeping, how we actually go about recording this stuff within our set of accounts. Before finally, sort of in the second half of tonight's session, we'll be moving into the spreadsheet side of things uh, and having a look at, uh, at one of those tasks as well. So yeah, we really do get a bit of a look across the board here um, in terms of uh, tasks. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive straight into our task here. You can see on screen, this is 12 marks worth of content that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, and we're looking at AGN & Co, uh, a firm of accountants here. Uh, in terms of what to note here at this stage, good bits of info to pick out straight away. The year-end date is always a good start. They will very often try and trip you up uh, with a lot of these year-end dates, so I would always be making a note of that. We don't necessarily need it for this first part of the question, but uh, always something as soon as I see that year-end term in there, I would be making a mental note of that as I read through the question. From here then, uh, part A of the task has asked us to help out with the year-end adjustments, and in particular, we're looking at inventory, okay? So if we're trying to bring in a value for inventory, can anybody help me out with what the main rule is we need to know about in terms of inventory? How would we go about coming up with some kind of total value? The low value is along the right lines. AJ, lower of cost, definitely the first part. Claire's got that complete sentence that I would encourage you to learn here. Absolutely, it's the lower of cost and net realizable value. Okay, so this is your golden rule when it comes to inventory. Lower of cost and net realizable value, okay? I would just be careful in terms of just simply picking the lowest number. They could potentially get you to do a little bit of workings there to arrive at either your cost figure or your net realizable value figure itself. So please do just remember those two things that you're looking for. In this case here, the two columns we've got here for all of our inventory items, we've got cost and we've got NRV for each of those different products. So we're set up here and we can start applying this rule. There's another important thing to remember when it comes to uh, inventory valuations and things like this, when we're talking about this year end adjustment, it's the idea that we need to work through line by line. So we can't simply total up each of these columns and then you know, take the bigger of the two totals. We need to consider each individual product by itself. So in this case here, if we're looking at product AA01, hopefully somebody can help me out in the chat box here, which of those valuations would we be looking at when it comes to AA01, just that first product here to start with? Going for NRV, going for £8.16, I like that a lot. Yeah, it's the lower of the two, so we're going to pick out the £8.16. Fantastic. Great stuff in the chat box there. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, just working through the remaining two, hopefully you're happy for me to tell you that for LZ01, we should be picking out the cost of £14.50. That is the lower of the two terms we've got there. And for BA24, we go back for that £2.84 over at the end there. Like so. OK, hopefully everybody's happy with what we've selected out here. 
All that remains at this point is a little bit of arithmetic here, just to come to our sort of total value here down at the bottom. We've got the valuation of each individual product now. All we need to do is apply this to the number of units that we've got. So it's just a case of multiplying these through to give us our overall valuation. Uh, running this through your calculator, they're not the catchiest of numbers, I'm afraid. So we should be looking at 114,240. We then get 126,512 pounds 50 for LZ01. And finally, 10,366 for our final product there, the BA24s. Justina, fantastic. Like to see that in the chat box. Some, some good answers in there as well. If you add all three of those different product lines up, you should end up with a total of 251, 118 pounds and 50 pence, like so. Okay, great stuff so far. Any questions or anything, please do let me know in the chat box as we go. But hopefully we're all happy with that for starters. OK, that's all they ask us here on in terms of inventory. That's all we have to work through uh, before we move on to something a little bit different. We're going to be looking at for the remainder of this task. We're going to be moving on to machinery. OK, so they've purchased a machine. They throw a whole load of information at us here uh, just to keep us on our toes. So we're just going to work through each of these different bits of info in turn and see what we think about them. OK, so. First off, we've got the machine purchase price, £15,000 during the year. Uh, we've got transportation costs coming in at £1,500, installation costs of £750. There was a breakdown at the end of the first month, so we had to pay £400 quid to repair it before finally getting on to some info on the depreciation itself. 10% on cost no residual value, and then a little bit more on depreciation. We'll come back to that in just a second. Okay. So, um, good question here in the chat box, actually, talking about training costs. Now, training costs, for the most part, uh, generally are not going to be included within the overall cost that you would look to capitalise. Um, the rule of thumb that we talk about here is that it's bringing something to its present location in its present condition okay so whatever we need to do to get a an asset to our warehouse to our business wherever it may be and to get it in a state that it's up and running would generally consist of those costs now training costs are much more to do with the staff themselves in terms of actually sort of operating the machinery so we don't tend to capitalize this the other reason really for it as well louise is staff tend to leave uh, so if you spend a load of money training staff who then walk and take a job with another business, uh, you've kind of already included a capital cost to something that's now gone. So it would lead to issues down the line in terms of what you need to dispose of and things like that. So generally speaking, Louise, uh, training costs are not going to come into this. Um, so, yeah, just want to bear in mind that no worries at all. OK, so just running through the numbers here quickly, uh, in terms of what we're looking at here, we are looking for the net book value. OK, we need to work out what this net book value is going to be at the end of one year. Got some answers coming into the chat box already. Did see uh, uh, some B's in there, some C's as well. We'll work through it. We'll see if we're in agreement seems like most people are going for C, but let's just check this out for ourselves and see what we can make of it. First things first, a good starting point here is going to be to work out what the, the value would be that we actually capitalise for this asset in the first place. If we need to work out what the value is going to be after one year, we need to know what the value would be at the start in order to then you know process it from there. That's going to be our starting point. OK, so. Starting off, definitely a good starting point here. Purchase of the machine, £15,000. Absolutely going to be the, 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 the decent starting point here. Imagine that on your invoice 
that is going to be the first line on there and that's definitely going to be uh, capitalized here what about transportation costs are we happy that that should be in there if we remember that that uh, that discussion we just had we need to get it to our present location into a working state so absolutely transportation costs are going to come into play plenty of you agreeing with me in the chat box as well always nice to see yes absolutely uh, if we don't pay that 1500 pounds we don't get it to our own business and we don't get it up and running so it's not going to do anything for us and therefore we should capitalize that cost similarly with installation costs again if we don't pay this figure we don't get it into our business in a state that it can generate any kind of value for us. So we're going to have to pay that installation cost here as well. That's to get it into a working condition in our current location, in that desired location, I should say. So yeah, absolutely. We're going to tag that one in there as well. What about the repairs? We had £400 of repairs to think about here. Any thoughts? Yeah, nice. I'm liking that use of the word expense here as well. Uh, lots of, uh, yeah, everybody agreeing this is definitely something we should not be bringing in. So I'm simply going to cross this out. It's a red herring here. They're trying to catch you out. The reason for this, again, it's actually been up and running for a month in this scenario here. So it was clearly in a working state before those repairs had to happen okay so it's not part of getting it to the warehouse and getting it into a usable state so this is as uh, a few of you have now said in the chat box here it's an expense it's an operational issue here that they've incurred and we should not be capitalizing it it would simply go through your statement of profit and loss as normal good stuff so our starting point here we now have our cost going to try and squeeze this in over here our cost should come in at 17 to 50. okay so that's our starting point at the beginning of the year we need the value in the accounts after one year so you know we've not added anything else onto this during the year or anything like that uh, the only thing we've got left to consider is that depreciation charge. It tells us that we depreciate 10% on cost. So we've got our cost figure at the top here. We're looking at 10% depreciation. There's no residual value. Good to know, means we don't have to factor that in. But the other important bit for us is that we charge a full year's worth of depreciation here in the first year of purchase this is the most you'll see this rule quite a lot within your uh, within your questions here and even in practice uh, it's very often something we used to, i used to see a lot while i was still working in practice uh, very often it's just easier to throw a full year's worth of depreciation in and not worry about any sort of pro rata ring or anything like that so in this case here we're going to bring in a full year's worth of depreciation And we're going to charge that at 10%. So we're going to lop 1725 off of that overall value, which should bring you out at a total of 15,525, which agrees with answer C over here. So those of you that went with C, good stuff. I did see actually people correcting themselves from B there as well uh and, and switching across to see um so yeah absolutely fine if as long as you're picking up on it yourself more than happy to see that so good stuff there guys okay next up we've got the other end of things here uh this is now talking about disposals so we've got an asset here it was originally purchased back in the day back in october x1 for 52,000 pounds. We eventually get around to selling this in the year ended X6. It sold for 35,000 pounds. Once again, it tells us about our depreciation method. 
10%. Uh, Sandra, um, just asking about the, uh, it, the installation cost. Yes, that is definitely part of the, uh, the, the actual cost we would capitalise there, Sandra. Um, as I say, the reason for this is that you need to get it into your premises and get it into a working condition. So if you never install it, if you don't pay to get it installed on your, your premises, it's not in a state that it would be operational. So you would include that as a capitalized cost as well. Okay, just want to watch out for there. Transportation is too, yeah, that cost figure we've got here is basically those three figures I've highlighted in blue. No problem at all. Okay, so moving back onto our disposal here, uh, we've got a purchase, it's October X1, and then we get rid of it finally in the year ended March X6. Okay, once again, though, within our depreciation rules, it's a full year when we purchase and no depreciation in the year of sale. Okay, so exactly the same rules we just worked with a second ago, in fact. Okay, so there's plenty of different ways you can reason this out. You can almost get your fingers out here and start counting out years. I'm going to walk you through it in sort of the long form approach here just to make sure you're happy with the approach. What I tend to do is get down all those dates because it's very easy to trip up here in terms of how many years you're going to need to depreciate. Um, we purchased this in October X1. So we would be recognizing a cost in our accounts at that point of £52,000. Uh, is it straight line? It is indeed. Yeah, it tells you this is on cost basis here, which is the equivalent of straight line. It's based around that initial cost that we bring in. OK, so we'll see this in a second here, in fact. But our first year end that we get to, remember, the year end itself is at the 31st of March. So the first year end we would get to from here, be very careful with your dates, is actually going to be March X2, okay? That's the first year end cutoff that we get to beyond that October purchase date. So in those accounts, we would depreciate at 10% and we would take 5,200 pounds off of that value, 10% straight line depreciation. From here, it's going to be a bit of rinse and repeat because we still own it in X3. So we would write another 5,200 off the value. We still own it in X4 for 5,200. Still own it in X5. As I say, it gets a little bit boring now. Um, before we get to our final year, March X6, which is our final year in question. And remember that there are there is no depreciation charged in that final year. OK, so the year we've sold it. Absolutely right, AJ. Fantastic. Make sure you're picking up on that rule in the in the, uh, the task up at the top there. There is nothing. No depreciation is charged, even if they hold it for the entire year and sell it on the very final day we still don't charge any depreciation at all. So nothing to bring in at the end here. And when you run all that through a calculator, we should be looking at a value in our accounts. So that's your next book value is 31,200 at that point of sale. Where's my first year, Laura? Uh, this is this one up here. OK, this is that March X2 year. So the, the, the reason they're telling us that we need to bring in a full year here is because we actually bought this in October. So we've only owned it for half of the year. You've got October, November, December, January, February, March. We only owned it for six months out of the 12. So normally you would have to pro rata that depreciation charge in order to you know, account for the fact that we've only owned it for half of the year rather than a full year's worth. Now, because of that rule that says we bring in a full year in that year of purchase, we don't mess around with any of that pro rataing 
and we just bring in the full 10%. So that's where we've dealt with that first year rule there, Laura. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So, however you reason this out, if you want to run this through in your head, get your fingers and thumbs out is what I always used to do in the exam to count out your years that you're going to be depreciating this for. I always tend just to list it out just to play it safe. It doesn't take too long, as you've just seen, uh, and it avoids any trip ups here with dates. You know, maybe you start out at X1 because you see X1 up here on the purchase date and you end up counting an extra year and things like that. So do just be careful with it. Take your time. I tend to go for this big list like so, but uh, it's, it's personal preference. Who knows what we do from here? Can anybody help me out? We know what value we had it included for in our accounts. We've got that net book value now. We know how much it was worth at that point of sale. How do we get to our answer here, which is to arrive at that profit or loss on disposal? Yeah, nice. I'd be careful with what you said there, the Karen, in terms of the sale less depreciation. It's it's actually the value that you're going to offset here rather than any kind of depreciation figure. Essentially, what we're going to do is consider how much money we made from that actual sale. So that's 35,000. And we're going to compare that to the value we had it for in the accounts. And we're going to find the difference between the two. In this case here, it's 3,800. So that eliminates two of our options. There's only a couple left to choose from here. We've got B or D. We need to think about whether this is a profit or a loss. I tend to think of this exactly as you would any other transaction. <laughs> exactly right, Laura. Yeah, this is definitely going to be profit in this case. Think about it exactly as you would any other transaction. We're saying we own something that's worth 31,200 to us. We've actually managed to sell it for 35,000 pounds. So we're actually better off. We made a profit off of this. So it should be option D as our final answer. Okay, uh, Claire, uh, am I right in thinking that rather than calculating this, for example, we would we could be asked to explain it in the exam instead? Uh, they could get you to talk about non-current assets and essentially how you treat them. Um, a couple of you were talking about the sort of email style summary questions. You could get a question about the treatment of non-current assets where you're talking through each of the steps. Generally there, you would be talking about bringing it in at cost and making sure you bring all of your costs in, charging depreciation and then disposing of it at the end and all the sort of bookkeeping side of things that go along with it. Uh, they absolutely could ask you a question where you are calculating it as we've done here. Uh, but yeah, they could get you to talk through that process instead. So yeah, as long as you're happy with the process itself, uh, you, you might need to, to uh, get that down within a sort of discussion based answer as well. Okay, final one here before we get into the spreadsheet side of things. It's quite a big question, but hopefully nothing too scary that we've not come across already here. Um, we've got a business here. The first thing they tell us, interestingly, is that we have a business who is not VAT registered. Okay, uh, their year end we're talking about is the 30th of June X6. And they've purchased a new cumber, new, new, <laughs> new cucumber, uh, a new computer. Uh, they paid £3,500, including VAT and a trade discount. Now, the reason they're telling us this is they're trying to make you fall into the trap here that this includes VAT and potentially you're going to need to do some kind of VAT adjustment. Now, why might we not need to do that? What's the important tidbit here in terms of this business that we've just discussed? Why would I be saying that we don't need to adjust this figure? Yeah, so it's linking back to the, to the fact it's not VAT registered. What would they be able to do if they were VAT registered that would potentially change our treatment here? 
Yeah, that that claim, Anthony. Yeah, Karen as well. Normally, the the VAT element of this, they would be able to reclaim from HMRC. But the fact that they are not VAT registered means that they can't recover on that VAT element. So the business itself is going to suffer the full cost of that transaction. Yeah, absolutely, Catherine, spot on. Really good way of putting that. So in this case here, the cost that we're looking at is going to be the £3,500. Okay, you're just going to bring it in. If you want to use the terminology, you're bringing in that gross figure because they can't reclaim the, uh, the VAT element. We're not worried about the trade discount either because, you know, we're more interested in the actual physical cost to the business itself. So that 3,500 figure seems to be the one to go with. Also tells us a little bit about residual value. We might need to consider that later, but I'm gonna leave it alone just for now. And then it goes into the depreciation policy. Okay. First bit of advice with these kind of questions, I would always have a look through the information you've got. Okay. So in this case here, you can see that we need to deal with the acquisition itself. So we're going to need to bring in the purchase of this item. We're then going to need to work out a depreciation charge for the year. Okay, so that's good to know. And then over the page, we've got various ledger accounts and a pick list of items to choose from as well. Now, the bit I want to point out to you and highlight, I'm literally going to highlight it as well, just for good measure, is this little bit here. There are brought down figures within these ledgers. That is going to be important when it comes to this depreciation charge, because we're not simply depreciating this new asset that we've purchased. We're going to need to, for sure. We're going to need to charge depreciation on that asset. But we've got some existing assets that have some value that we're going to need to consider there too. Okay. So more on that when we get on to part B here. Um, just something to bear in mind. And that's why I would always tend to look through all of the information you've got before jumping into these questions. It's very easy to miss that if you do part two first without ever looking at part three. So it could be quite easy to miss. Anyway, uh, in terms of our acquisition, we've kind of already discussed all the important bits here. We need to bring in this new asset. So we're gonna record this within computer equipment. This is going to be the cost of that new asset, which we've already said is gonna be 3,500 pounds. And presumably it just tells us that we've purchased this. It doesn't tell us anything about any kind of credit uh, and any kind of credit terms or any loan agreements or anything like that. So I would completely agree with you here, Laura the other side is gonna go against the bank. Okay, we assume we've just paid this out. So I'm gonna throw a credit in there for the, uh, the other side of this journal. Remember it's got to balance. So there we go, we're happy with that. Okay, part two is that depreciation charge. So my first step here is to consider in terms of this charge, what the value of my existing assets are. Because the depreciation policy that we're working with this time is that it's 25% reducing balance. So we're not interested in the original cost this time round. We're interested in the value of the assets. Okay, so we need to work out what it is at the start of the period and then just work out a flat percentage on that. We've got that same rule again, full year of depreciation in the year of acquisition and nothing in the year of disposal. We haven't actually got any, any, uh, dis uh, any disposals here to, work or to worry about. So I'm gonna leave that alone. Yes, good stuff in the chat box. So Justina, in terms of considering the value of this new asset, has factored in that residual value. 
Now, the important thing, as Laura has said, and actually done my job quite nicely for me, so I'm actually just going to read out Laura's answer here. Residual values are only going to be taken into account when using straight line basis. So with reducing balance, we're not worried about any values at the end of its life. We're simply just going to apply a flat percentage to whatever the starting value is. So we don't actually have to worry about this residual value bit here. That is a bit of a red herring. OK, so again, one to watch out for. You'd need to factor it in if we were working with straight line. But in this case here, because it's reducing balance, don't need to worry about it. So my starting point here, I need to consider the net book value of my existing assets. So if I go down the page here, you can see we've got a cost of those original assets of 18,300. And we've already got a little bit of depreciation built up against that. So there's 3,140 coming off against it. OK, we need to reduce that by that figure. So it's going to be the cost that we had brought forward of 18,300. Less any accumulated depreciation of 3,140. So we know the assets that we already have in the business has a have a value there of 15,160, like so. That's what we've got to start with. Now, we already know from up above that we've got a new asset to deal with as well. So I can add that in. So if I bring in my acquisition here, we said that had a value of 3,500. So I know that my net book value within the business is now looking at 18,660. And I can charge depreciation on that at 25%. So the figure I need for my adjustment here comes out at £4,665. Is everybody happy with where I've pulled all those numbers from? Please do stop me if, uh, if I've lost you at any point there. But hopefully... You can reason that through now I've gone through it. Okay, so I can pull that figure in. 4665 needs to go around either way. Any suggestions here? What's my double entry look like? Oh, Laura, you were ready for me, weren't you? You knew I was going to ask that. <laughs> Are we in agreement with Laura? Laura's saying debiting depreciation charge crediting accumulated depreciation plenty of yeses coming through the chat there looks like we're all on board fantastic and i completely agree as well absolutely so the debit needs to go as an expense to our statement of profit and loss so that's that depreciation charge code and the other side is going to go to our accumulated depreciation, like so. Uh, Pavlina, why do we depreciate all the costs? I think only the equipment. Yeah, so you can't simply just consider that acquisition because you would be depreciating all of the assets you own. And if we go across to our ledger accounts here, you can see that we have some other assets that we've brought in previous periods. So they would continue to depreciate going forward. So that's what we did in the first part of this is to work out how much value we had for our existing assets before we added on our new ones and worked out what our depreciation charge would be for the year. Hopefully that clears that one up. Lovely. OK. So final bit here really is just to get all this stuff transferred across into our ledger accounts. So we're just going to post these journals that we've got here. So the first one I'm going to bring in is that computer equipment at cost. So that was a debit 
to our computer equipment at cost line. Our description uh, that goes in alongside that is going to be the other side of the double entry. So this is our computer equipment at cost. The other side of this went against the bank. So in terms of my audit trail, I'm going to write in the word bank as my description here. Just to make sure we can trace this back if we have any issues down the line, we know that we should see a similar transaction in that bank ledger account as well. Fortunately for us, we do not have the bank ledger account here to work with. We've only got these three particular accounts to work with, so we don't need to record that anywhere. We're done with journal one from the earlier parts. We go back to journal two here. We're just bringing in that depreciation charge. So over here in our depreciation code, we need to bring in 4665 as our debit entry. And it was crediting the accumulated depreciation code. Again, remember the descriptions here. It's the opposite side of the transaction that you write down as your description. So it's going to be a depreciation charge here. And computer equipment accumulated depreciation for the other side there. Uh, Sandra, I agree it's a bit misleading. So I've just had a question here um, that in terms of the information. They haven't expressly spelled it out within this scenario at the top. This is why I, I would urge you to always read through all of the information you've got here. Uh, it's very sneaky, I agree. Uh, they could have actually flagged this up to you, uh, but they, they could potentially expect you to read this off of those ledger accounts and pick out that information yourself. So yeah, it's definitely one to watch out for. And that's why I would always look through all of that information before you start answering any of the questions, because you may miss stuff like that. So it's, it's the wording on here. It just asks for the depreciation charge for the year. So it's for everything is kind of the, uh, the inclination there. That's kind of what they're hinting at here. It's for everything that we need to bring in. Okay, I hope that helps. It, it, it definitely, it definitely tricky. Yeah, it's, it's definitely sneaky of them to do it this way. I'm hoping they'd at least flag it up or at least put the ledger accounts before that part of the question so you can't miss it. Um, but they could potentially do something like this if they're feeling particularly mean on the day they write this. OK, so we've got everything in our ledger accounts now. So what we've got is we need to close these down. So we go through our sort of stage procedure. Uh, Bradley, it will get sent around. If you're registered to this, there will be links to, to all the, the tasks and everything included within that. So you should get that automatically anyway, Bradley. Um, we now need to just close down these ledger accounts. So the approach we take is that we work out which side is the bigger of the two. It's fairly straightforward in all three of these, to be fair. Uh, we're looking at 21,800 as our bigger total on our asset costs. We're going to bring that total in on both sides and then work out whatever figure we need to stick in here to make the numbers work. In this case here, it's just the 21,800 because we haven't got anything on the right hand side currently. And we now need to think about what type of ledger we're talking about here. So if we're talking about computer equipment, this is an asset. OK. So this is going to be related to the statement of financial position. Fantastic. Liking that SOFP in my chat box. That's what we like. Um, do just be careful with this. This is going to be a balance that we carry down. So it should be CD at the end here for this one, essentially because this is going to roll on year on year. The idea is that your assets don't simply disappear because we roll into a new period. The hint you've got is actually that we had brought down at the beginning of the period. So if you're, you know, on the fence as to which one to use, 
it's going to be the opposite one to what we've got at the top. Similarly, go through that same exercise again. The bigger total is over here on the right this time. Enter it on both. Work out whatever figure we need to throw in to make the, the maths work. And once again, this will be a balance carried down. This is the accumulated depreciation. So this will offset this asset at the top here. Okay, essentially that will leave you with that value in your accounts. So it should be carried down here as well. Great stuff. Final one, just to close this out. Again, not particularly interesting in this case. We've only got one figure in, case, in this case here. So we're looking at 4665. It goes in both of those places. And I can see plenty of you already telling me that the depreciation charge is an expense. So it's going to go to the statement of profit and loss. So this would then be transferred to the statement of profit and loss because we don't want it to roll forward year on year. AJ, uh, is accumulated depreciation a liability? You can think about it like that. I tend to think about it as, as kind of a reduction in the value of an asset, uh, but you'll end up in exactly the same position, AJ. Um, so you're absolutely fine. As I say, th this one's actually sitting on the opposite side, so it would be a, a negative asset because it would sit within that asset section of your statement of financial position. But if you want to think about it as a liability, in this case here, you would be absolutely fine to do so. Yeah, no worries, AJ. Awesome. Um, any final questions here, folks, uh, in terms of that one? That's everything we need here. Um, Justina, back to the first question. Any particular reason why we count inventory at the lower of cost and net realizable value? Yeah, so it's just thinking about it as from a business perspective. Remember, this set of accounts needs to give a true and fair view of the, you know, how much value these assets have to us as a business. So what we're comparing is the cost to us up to this point as a good starting point here in terms of trying to value this, um, you know, knowing the costs that have gone into a physical item would give you a good indication about what the value of it is at this point. If we know that we're going to sell this at a loss, which is in fact the case with these other two, we would be overstating the value of our assets if we simply threw it in at cost, because we know that it's not actually worth that much. Maybe these items are a bit obsolete. They're a bit old. They're a bit rubbish. So we can't actually sell them. And we're actually going to end up selling them at a loss. As you can see here, the net realizable value, the final sales proceeds are actually much less. So it makes sense that we need to adjust that value of the asset itself down because it's never going to make us that much money. OK. So that's why you need to consider both of these positions. Fantastic, good stuff.